For the last three years, Time for a Reset has been fortunate to sit down with some of the brightest minds in the global marketing world, and we have curated the most inspiring and impactful moments just for you. To celebrate our third anniversary, we are bringing this special edition episode with some of our guests from the New York Times, Coca-Cola, Verizon, L'Oreal, Nivea, KFC, Lenovo, Reckitt, Heineken, and the industry creative legend, Rory Sutherland. Whether you're a CMO and are looking for inspiration or are a marketer ready for the next career step, get ready to be enlightened by the invaluable wisdom of global leaders. Right, what you talked about earlier, like the adaptability and the willingness to fail and throw things that don't work to one side, that kind of culture is one that you can only build if you've got the right mindset to actually kind of keep and probably setting that big hairy goal for 2027 keeps everyone focused on well it's a big goal so therefore doing little things probably doesn't get you all the way so you need to take a bit of risk be bold (laughs) I'm sure that's been part of the plan right yeah, totally. It's interesting. I'm convinced that there are a few businesses that move faster mm-hmm. than ours at the times. You know, we're a digital subscription business, which, as I mentioned, you know, drives this inherently relentless pace. We're in a stage of high growth. We have this yeah. 15 million subscribers goal that we have to hit by the end of 27. We move at the speed of the news cycle, which is 24 seven. And we have this much more <laughs> complex business with a lot of products that are at various life stages that we want to grow as fast as possible. And so it really adds up to the fact that we mm. have this relatively small marketing team churning out an incredibly high volume of work. And we find that it's easy to just like chug along producing, producing and not being able to make time for the more strategic, the harder, the longer term work of building new capabilities or interrogating our strategy and taking a step back to look at the big picture. Like our big goal has always been the same, which is getting people to pay (laughs) for quality journalism. But on the margins, there's a lot of things we've had to change. So just for example, we're facing this in our email practice right now where the team is shipping really good stuff that's driving the business, but we are struggling to find time to develop new capabilities that would ultimately make us more efficient. They just seem so hard to get to. And that's been a big focus for us this year. I was just in a meeting yesterday with a team, took me through the results of some focused efforts where we prototyped using automation to speed up some of our more complex email deployments. And it was so great to see the results, of course, the numbers, but to see the excitement in the team and the enthusiasm that they can use the time that they've created from this one efficiency gain to invest in other capabilities and efficiency gains. It's like a great case of success begets success. (laughs) And um, I hope we can keep that momentum up across other parts of our practice. I just wanted to touch on, I guess, this overall shift that we've seen in the last few years towards direct-to-consumer D2C. I guess during the pandemic, it felt like everything was about new, slicker, faster D2C brands stealing share from some of the bigger manufacturers. Whereas it feels like two, three years on, many FMCGs have caught up, maybe not in all aspects, but at least they now have meaningful e-commerce strategies and they have D2C operations where there is at least some form of test and learn, as you said. And in the meantime, we've probably also seen a lot of D2C struggle because they can't get repeat purchase. They can't actually make profit from some of their promotional early customer acquisition attempts, or they lack investment, or the money dries up, or even just the inflation in performance marketing channels that makes it pretty hard to run a business when you don't quite know how much you're going to pay to acquire a customer. So you're obviously pretty close to this space. Like, what do you see happening right now in this space? Again, is you can take it from a big organization point of view. And I think the most important element, whether we go or not in the DTC space, if you have money, you can just buy an organization and then you get the product in place and you just deliver it. But I guess the, for me, there are two ways to look at it. So the first one is, of course, Yes, it won't be a big challenge for you because especially in FMCG, X, you are, you're talking about more than 70, 80% of your sales happening in the brick and mortar environment. So the first approach is to look at DTC because again, the cost to entry now is so low. You know, you have Shopify, the Shopify model, or you can go to have your marketplace model or your THG model, whatever model you can choose. But the way I see it, it's really an opportunity to offer 
something that the consumer won't find anymore. So for instance, Sony, they had a DTC model. The way we're using it, it was mainly for super fans. So, you know, when you have a new phone coming out, you know that these people will go on our DTC platform and then buy the product. And this is a way to reward those fans with additional incentive, of course, to collect first party data, but also because you know that these fans are loved or brand. This is a way, especially for high expensive product, is about getting a repeat purchase on a regular basis. Every year we have a new phone. Etc. If I'm looking at it from an FMCG perspective, again, this is the tricky bit because, yes, of course, you have your super fans. You can also look at different models of whether you want to offer bulk buying. I think Coca Cola is doing this. There's also the e commerce mod- B2B model, which is something that Unilever is doing really well. So it's called Value Pro, which is mainly attracting small businesses to their platform and then to sell everything online rather than going to the traditional route in that space. The second way I'm also seeing this is also about more asset test and learning. So a way to test new products. So if you want to launch a new product in the market, you can just use a DTC approach to see whether there's an appetite from the consumer for this product. And if it's working, let's scale it up to brick and mortars, to pure play, etc. And then the other bit is the last one for me is about you know first party data. So yeah, of course you will get a higher margin if you own the channel, but I don't think you know we can talk about a big percentage of the sales happening in this area. So what else can you maximize? And I think you know capturing first party data to enrich your audience, to enrich your database is a good way to look at it as well. And as I said, the barrier to entries are so low now. So it's interesting you bring this up because we have I was having this exact discussion with a client and it's around how do you position that into a C-suite where they can understand very clearly the net effect of a performance marketing um, initiative, but can't quite see the connection between that halo effect of long-term impact of brand marketing against a short-term performance goal and don't really understand that relationship. So how do you articulate that to a C-suite of like the importance of brand marketing? Yeah, yeah. It's all about creating alignment. Right. And I think what that starts with as, as marketing leadership is, and, and I said this before, we have to look beyond the traditional traditional role of marketing leadership and become architects of growth for the companies that we serve. My purpose as a marketing leader or you know, the purpose of a CMO is not to advertise or market, but rather to grow the business and the category sustainably. Being an impactful leader and an effective partner is about working through others and building advocacy among our C-suite colleagues. So you ask how we create alignment. I think it's really, it's three factors. I think first, it's about collaboration. We absolutely must be taking a collaborative outlook to the work that we do and the organizations that we lead. The fundamentals of marketing are expanding so fast, Fiona, and so far that successful marketing leaders are those who manage change by fostering a collective sense of enterprise and collaboration, which is pinned together by trust. Carried across the entire company, collaboration can really be a powerful motivator. When it's weak or it falls prey to competing interests, we risk achieving little beyond adding to the chaos. So I think it's paramount that you have to have an appetite for embedding cross-functional advocacy and collaboration into your cultural fabric instead of just doing what we've always been told. I think the second thing is we got to be good at removing the noise. Simply put, we got to simplify what matters to the business and to the rest of the C-suite. You got to be clear to everyone about what will make a difference to your business performance. You got to stay focused on how marketing is contributing to the overall business goals and communicate the value to the rest of the company. And finally, we can't be speaking marketer, right? I think that we as, as marketers, whether you're on the creative side, the performance side, the demand gen side, we have to abandon any marketing lingo in favor of business lingo. You got to be able to talk fluently at the C-suite level about how a particular strategy is going to affect financial outcomes. You have to be a tenacious driver of growth. But you also have to understand that that growth has to be real and sustainable. The strategies that you drive are going to be humanized and the metrics more holistic. And if you're really committed to creating a brand and a business with a purpose that's going to be both culturally as well as socially impactful, then inextricably, you have to be committed to real growth and let your C-suite colleagues see that, plain and simple. 
let's like zoom out a little bit to more of the industry. I mean, you talked about how you create this culture of innovation, curiosity, and innovation in L'Oreal. I often talk to marketers or see marketing organizations where perhaps that same curiosity for new technology and getting deep into it isn't necessarily there. I wonder, like, if you were looking at the discipline of marketing, what would you say that marketeers need to get better at when they turn up the board table? My goodness, that's, that's a tough question. You know, there's, we used to talk about T-shaped marketers, you know, one speciality and, and a bit of generalism. I think now mm. we're moving to M because you need a few. There's two pieces to your question. There's one is what do marketers need to do differently sort of to, to evolve? And then there's another bit about the boardroom. I think those are probably two slightly different ones. I think that the first one is that we all need to get better at balancing data and strategy versus kind of creativity and emotion. And it's really about balancing. It's not about abandoning mm-hmm. one or the other. I think then, you know, the, the boardroom question is a harder one. The boardroom question is about KPIs and indicators and really reminding everyone about what marketing does. Marketing is about growth. And so it's about making sure that there's a real connection between marketing activities and growth and, and financial results, because at the end of the day, those are the ones on the PL. That's not always easy. I have a couple of finance degrees. I don't have a marketing degree, or at least not in that sense. So, so I may be more comfortable with the numbers in the PL, but some marketers aren't. But that's mm. the, those are the discussions that happen at the boardroom. Yeah, no, I agree. You've got to be able to demonstrate how marketing investment is contributing to growth in the business, even if that's not all in the short term. I think the biggest challenge is the, is the short term, long term piece, right? Um, and, and you use and, the word uh, marketing investment rather than marketing spend. You know, it, it's just right. nuances like that that are so important. Obviously, change is very difficult. A lot of people push back on change. It sounds like you've got a lot of buy in from the business to make change, to sort of mature, to transform. Did you have to work hard to get that or, or was that very evident in an environment like yours during COVID when you know online buying sort of shot up, et cetera? How did that happen? Everyone innately understands that digitalization changes the game and just where the consumer attention's gone. All of that plays a big part then to giving you the mantra that yes, change has to happen or change is inevitable, whether you're on board or not. Like that's that can be the difference between make or break of a business. So I think that there's kind of innate understanding for that. But then the second bit of it is, have you built enough trust within your business to be able to fly the flag for that and have the reign to actually make that change? And to, you know, do you have got the right resources? Have you got the right people on board? Have you got the right agencies there? Can you make that change happen? And that all comes from also building trust within the team. So a lot of the work that we've done as a team is around that, around how do you build trust in something that not necessarily everyone understands, but people trust you that, yeah, you're kind of going along that right path. Yeah. I hate to press you and tell me if you can't, but are there specific examples of that that you can cite? So I I think probably the one that we've talked about in the past is probably something like experimentation. So and like driving an experimentation agenda, which with a company like Beiersdorf is, is, you know, we're not necessarily long term geared up for rapid experimentation. We're not a Facebook, we're not a Netflix. Our products are innately physical, they're products that you can't hold in your hands. So when you talk about rapid experimentation, people will kind of step back and go, well, this our cycle plans two years long. You know, some of our innovations take 10 years to come through. So how do you take what are essentially kind of a Silicon Valley principle of experimentation and try and put that into a, a company like Biosdorf that is traditional kind of CPG? And what we try to do with that is take some very small steps. So really try and and at least in the first instance not really have a mind of we want to run like 400 experiments a year or we want to make huge change it's right let's start with five experiments let's see how that goes as a small group and let's almost test and learn the way that we do that as we go as well so we we set up an experimentation team was was at the start of 2020 with the goal of let's try and run you know three experiments a week and let's try and get to a good cadence of that and they can be tiny experiments just really small ones at, at the start and and that's kind of snowballed now and we've been able to build the resource and everything that's around that but that started really small so and i think and i think that's also built with it an understanding that transformation and, and change doesn't necessarily have to occur and if you look at where we were and how our website was at that point um, and how kind of operating was then versus like where it is now. It's it's a huge difference, but that's built through a lot of tiny steps along the way. What I think is quite interesting, and you and I have touched on this before, is how I think the proximity of those relationships between tech and marketing and has led to you adopting like ways of using agile within your marketing team, which 
a lot of marketers are a little bit fearful of because they don't want to work in a kind of too constricted kind of straight jacket way. But I know we've talked about it before. I'd, I'd love to kind of maybe touch on that a little bit because I think the last time we spoke, you were actually able to almost, not perfectly, but quantify some revenue gain from having adopted that type of hypothesis, run experiments, optimized type of approach. So could you share like a few words on that? Yeah, of course. And I can understand why many marketers are fearful because we've been running at some of this and I remain fearful and conflicted as well as we do it, but there's absolutely benefit there. So when we think about true agile, so how we organize and work with you know, design teams, brief them and empower them to deliver mm -hmm. outcomes. We started that in 2020. So towards the back end of 2020, as if we had nothing else going on, um, <laughs> just trying to do that. And through that, we ran a series of agile performance streams across different verticals. So we had them across menu management, across advertising, media, CRM, and ran like a, a very fixed term sprint project. So through that, and we were able to experiment, um, validate, a series of optimizations that we then put in place in 2021 that delivered an incremental 80 million pounds of revenue. And we were able to directly attribute all of that incrementality to those work streams. So we absolutely were able to make the use case for that. I think where we've struggled or frankly, where we're, where, um, we're yeah. delivering, you know, we're marketing working in an agile web tech's been less successful for us has been in, in actually delivering products and features okay. um, as we build new platforms. And so we kind of work like, you know, reviewing and con continue to think about our ways of working around the role that Agile plays from a marketing standpoint in delivering yeah. features and products. I think the fact is that from an optimization standpoint, when you've got a live product, um, been phenomenal for us and we continue to do that. And then mm. we also then apply a lot of that mindset maybe not in a true agile way, but mm. if I think about test and learn, flexibility, um, you know, being adaptable, absolutely that becomes like, really important in how we work from a marketing standpoint. So we're about to into a big, a big campaign for the World Cup. And mm. as part of that, we know like, so, I mean, very exciting. We've got a winter World Cup. Um, we've had two failed Christmases. People are gonna be at home and they're going to want to indulge in spite mm. of, you know, all of the madness and pressures that are going on. You know, I think that we're going to want to make something of this Christmas. So uh, what we know is when the football's on, delivery sales skyrocket. And so we are like, you know, we're going to be running campaign and driving KFC awareness, visibility, and then performance media around the World Cup. But what we also know is our restaurants are going to be under exceptional pressure through that. And... The only thing worse than like being off sale or not communicating is giving our customers a really poor experience. So it's really you know, like, and we will be hitting these super peaks where over a very short period of time, the pressure on our restaurants will be massive. And we wanna make sure that we're giving customers a great experience. And what that means is we need to be able to manage our media in really effective ways so that when restaurants are under pressure, we're not streaming a whole load of sales to that individual restaurant. So we are working with Mindshare, our media partners, um, on like a programmatic tool, which allows us to be incredibly flexible and not just across digital channels, but across out of home and audio channels too. I'd love to hear a little bit about your approach and philosophy to digital marketing. You talked about that team, but I'd love to hear about how did you approach it and what did you bring to Lenovo in terms of your philosophy? Having the agency experience and also understanding how technology works really, really helped shape and, and form the crossroads of the core areas of what the Media Center of Excellence and the in-housing project, which we began at Lenovo as a team, helped me a lot to put those skill sets together. A strong value of exchange, of being able to use those experience of joining and connecting the dots between the audience and the content quality of advertising of what we're doing with our agency partners was very important. 
we were bringing different work streams together from marketing, from finance, from using advertising technology to its maximum, and ultimately working towards future-proofing our marketing organization. And that's what we really set out to deliver, and we are delivering on those processes. So we're on track on, of what we initially planned of achieving. And brilliant. So you talk a little bit about the ad tech piece there. I'd love to sort of delve into a little bit about sort of that transformation disruption process. What does it mean to you as a digital marketer and how has it sort of manifested itself at Lenovo? It's a really good question. I don't think that there is a single blueprint for every marketing organization, every advertiser. Every brand, every advertiser has its individual nuances which have to be addressed. Identifying the building blocks that drives growth through marketing is the initial step. And being able to then shape the pillars of what transformation means for the organization is critical to the success. Transformation is a continual state of change through innovation. And this can be from the talent that you have within the company, through the engagements that you have with your partnerships, through to understanding what your customer user journey is all about. And to be able to take those data streams and the number of those data streams to be joined together and drive the company's transformation process is what is all about disrupting what the status quo is today within the company and transforming the marketing org. Because transformation per se, it's a number of different pillars and building blocks put together to be able to achieve an objective rather than having a single objective to be able to define what transformation for a company would look like. As part of your transformation work, Jason, what are the strategic areas that you have already invested in or are thinking about Reckit owning more and taking more responsibility of? Yeah. So this kind of ties in with in-housing, doesn't it? And I think there's a view in the industry that a lot of big clients are in-housing everything and they don't want to pay for external partners. They can do it cheaper or better themselves. You know, our view is a bit more nuanced than that. Well, first of all, we see massive value in external partners, you know, We're good at some things. We respect that an external perspective is essential. There are some things that external partners will always do better than we do. But to answer your question, there are some areas that we feel that are so strategically important that we need to own. Not to say that others don't help us build them and contribute to them, but some areas that spring to mind are are oversight of our MarTech stack. You know, you can't do marketing today unless you have a MarTech strategy. If it's fragmented or it's not aligned with your objectives, then you're going to have issues to scale and do things consistently well. So Marte, comm strategies. We have a fantastic comm strategy team led by a great ex-agency guy, Clay, who you know, has brought all his knowledge from the agency world. But we partner with agencies. We use their tools. The agencies have got some awesome tools, but we do it in the wreck way with our IP and consistently around the globe. Audience strategy, we built what we call desks, so basically hubs and best practice. And it all starts with audience. So we bring an audience strategy into the organization. But on the other side, there are areas that we recognize that aren't our core strength, that partners can do better, whether it's strategic partners like a BCG or, you know, they provide a great external view or some of the very technical operational partners at the other end. So throughout our operating system, we have best in class partners plugged in and it's evolving because we're becoming more sophisticated. Our asks are changing and so is our asks of our partners. And we've kind of gone full circle in the conversation, but we know we talk about how do we work with partners, you know. We recognize it to work with them. We've got to really let them in. And I don't know in the organization that some people actually realize they're an external partner because they're in-house, they're part of the team, they're an extension of the team. Diving a little bit back sort of into sort of that data-driven media director to role, I'd love to sort of dig into a bit that as sort of, the, the we all know that the industry has become more data and tech-led. You've obviously got it in your job title. How does it sort of change the operating model that you have within Heineken? So it's some of it's a bit similar to the, the first very first question about creativity. I think data and technology should be empowering people and simplifying things mm. for people. Like most of the businesses, we will be always on a journey to improve our processes by using technology and data. So we are doing it in our buying, in the simple terms. Sorry, we'll probably start with planning because it's it's, uh, going through the process. We absolutely use data and tech to inform our planning and to we use a CCS planner with them so that is incorporating all sorts of questions, aspects, panel data, all the way down to DNI aspects as well. Yeah, to help us to create high quality audiences 
we are now integrating more and more of retailer data into our planning. So bringing together better brand and conversion, which is often for FMCG brands, I think is a challenge because although we absolutely 100% agree with Byron Sharp that we have to drive reach is important, there is absolutely room to make sure we scoop that demand better as well. So bringing together retail and a broad brand through data at the start of the process and throughout really helps. We use data and tech for buying more and more. And I think the platforms like Meta, like Trade Desk, like Google, they all are using AI nowadays. They all are using automation. So we've been adapting those tools for buying nonstop. So for my team, it's an, it's an ongoing learning process. And obviously, we've been using it for a few years, of course, dynamic creative optimization and tools for DCO. We've been doing it for our product campaigns. We've been doing it for our brand campaigns like Euros in 2021, variety of weather-related campaigns. It's, it's a basics for us now. And then when it comes to, I think, measurement, of course, that also comes to life and we're trying to use more and more of the automated ways to measure outcomes. I'd say this is the longest one for us to go again because we just don't all point to sales. A lot of it becomes quite manual process for the business. So that's, I think, well, where broadly we are. In terms of would this change operating model broadly, like if you take a level up from media into marketing, it won't. I just don't, I can't really see how our commercial planning is going to change because we have data and tech. What should happen is to become more effective and efficient. So we spend less time collecting the data for our identifying jobs to be done and more time discussing those jobs to be done and making informed decisions. That's the thing what we all are trying to achieve. And what's interesting there is AI. I bet the next question would be about AI. There's a lot of new brands that have emerged, kind of D2C, e-commerce, whatever you call them. And they have yeah. a very different way of going to market from a marketing perspective to the FMCGs. And I remember you said when we were chatting that back when you started, something like 68, 70% of all spend was FMCG. And obviously <laughs> now it's like probably 20% or something. Yeah, no, package, package, package goods and beer, package goods and beer was something like in 1990. Four, there was something like 67% of ad spend, and now it's like 20. And that has a difference if you're an agency, because more and more of your clients are operating not within a marketing culture of a Unilever or a Reckitt or a Cadbury. They're operating within a marketing culture, which is an engineering or finance culture. And it's much, much more obsessed with quantification, and it's much, much more kind of reductionist and deterministic in its mindset and that makes it doubly difficult and I I often argue that the quality that a good marketer is someone who can do things that his finance director doesn't like because a lot of good marketing of necessity will be everything that a finance director hates which is it's probabilistic it's experimental okay and in many cases it's fuzzy and it's it, it may be immeasurable by the way as well i think that's right. important to note if you do that uh, by the way there's an interesting question here okay yeah. so let's look at game theory if you think that advertising that you can't measure at the individual level still works and you also think that your competitors are too nerdily obsessed to do that kind of advertising then you should do that kind of advertising because it's a source of comparative advantage. Your mm. ability to do things that your competitors wouldn't be able to do is definitely something you should explore, because now enjoying excess share of voice when your competitors can't copy you is right. probably significantly easier. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I, think, I think one of the things is to go into tech companies and say, because tech nerds hate marketing, that's, that's not me, that's Peter Thiel, okay? Yeah, I've heard Peter that. Thiel in his book Zero One says, nerds hate marketing, but nerds need to pay attention to marketing because it works on nerds and it works on you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Time for a Reset, the marketing podcast with global leaders brought to you by CVE Marketing Growth Consultancy. We actively help brands solve many of the challenges discussed in this episode, whether that is defining strategy and a marketing operating model, your data and technology infrastructure, 
or solving measurement and data activation challenges, we work alongside brands to build marketing as an engine that drives business growth. We'll be back talking to another cutting edge marketer soon. Until then, make sure to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts.